So, yeah, I want to get right into this thing. How would you describe what exactly it is that you do? Because you have uh, quite the extensive resume from what I've seen. So how would you kind of summarize all that you do? Yeah, so essentially I'm an epigenetic psychotherapist and um, I'm also a clinical hypnotherapist. Um, I'm also psychic and I'm intuitive. So I train to be an intuitive pranic healer um, to kind of organize, I guess, my abilities in a way that I can use them in a productive manner. And I trained for many years in cultivation of life force cultivation and that this is really my main area is to train people to become masters of their life force to cultivate their life force for co-creation and it's in that realm that merges with all these other things of the lucid the, the lucid realms um you know or uh, the dream states that are available to us that become unlocked as a result of the mastery of that so I became an epigenetic psychotherapist because my interest was, uh, my curiosity was in how we have patterns that we inherit through generations, how they affect us, and how does that affect your spiritual evolution? Because um, as a result of my research with experiencers, with ET contactees and experiencers, I discovered that ET contact runs in the family. Oh. And uh, certain family groups seem to be associated with specific bloodlines, starseed bloodlines. Um, and I don't believe that those patterns are necessarily a coincidence. I think that um, it's information that's also encoded in our DNA, which is in the holographic system of our DNA. Um, it is something that um, is, is essentially it activates when a person begins to activate their higher faculties, all that memory is recovered. And it's oh. something that's been talked about by many sages, you know, through history that talk about remembering being in their mother's womb, remembering past lives, um, and then embodying different avatar bodies or vessels in, in different dimensions. So those memories are important to a human for their spiritual evolution and their cultivation. So this is where my work is primarily helping people deprogram the limiting belief systems that don't allow them to activate these faculties and heal the bloodline, essentially. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty powerful stuff. So where does one start on this journey, would you say, to uh, reclaim these lost memories? How do we even begin? Yeah, um, you know, the end goal isn't so much about the recovery of the memory as it is the pathway to that recovery of memory in general, of who you are as a greater universal organism of consciousness. And really, it's, it's in every moment that is uh, an access point to these dimensions. When we completely embody the present moment, when we are completely still in a state of observation and we cultivate the zero point, this is where you begin to understand that we are multidimensional and people begin to sense things around them more than just their physical environment. Yeah. An entire universe opens up of information. And the beauty of that is that because we exist in a self-organizing universe, the things that are existing around you, which you are navigating and, and sharing with, those are not random things. They are things that are an extension of you through vibrational resonance. So I think the, the first point is for you to cultivate that zero point. And that is actually the hardest part because we are heavily stimulated and we are heavily addicted. We are heavily addicted to biochemicals, emotions, um, that are streaming through our body, constantly looking for that next hit of stimulation. And so we are kind of in a dormant hypnosis, addicted to this physical realm. And we need to wake up consciousness in a way to understand um, the patterns that we're living and to question whether those patterns are creative or are they counter creative? You know, do they go against creation? Because, um, one of the beautiful things about this universe is that at the very at the very molecular level of this universe, everything seems to take the form of a spiral, the pathway of which life force organizes itself is through a spiral. And 
That's the nature of this universe. But if the human goes into unconscious states, it falls into that spiral. And that spiral, when it, when it lessens the vibrational frequency of that movement, of its life choices, of its experiences, it actually, it, it, it dissolves, it dies. It, it goes into a counter-creative cycle. It's self-destructive, you know? Yeah. There's an entire science, really, and an entire architecture to this, to this dimension that we exist in, that when we cultivate higher state of awareness, higher emotions, we actually can harmonize with these different spiral systems of the universe. And that is the key to becoming this universal human, this human that is in harmony with each other, with this, the things that are happening in our lives, and making choices that are kind of in, in the benefit of the collective rather than a self-serving choice. Mm. Yeah, very well said. Would you say those choices are intuitive? They just sort of come natural when one establishes the practices and rituals in one's life to be able to tap into this zero point energy. It's sort of um, effortless in a way. Yeah. So actually, the funny thing is that the less someone does, like action does, the more they come into harmony with things. Because in, in our society, we are deeply uh you know, we, we, we are stuck in these programs of societal engineering of who we need to be, who we have to be, what our life should look like, you know, in order to succeed or to survive, really, in this, in this dimension. Everything is based on survival. And so when you have an entire human race that's focused on survival, um, it completely, it, it goes actually against the ability to harmonize with your environment which is essentially what would be the highest rate of survival would be for you to be in harmony just like animals you know they're very aware of themselves their roles a lot of that is instinct but that instinct is very intelligently designed in in a in a, in a kind of organized system with other natural animals and, and, and natural uh, systems so we actually have to deprogram from these um you know these narratives that we that we believe of survival, and because the human is is totally different than an animal, it it is a co-creative organism of consciousness that is interconnected to nature. But when the human comes into its integration, it actually can have mastery over matter. It can actually shift, and uh, our concept of time doesn't really apply to the evolution of man in that way because our, our, our concept of time is very limited. So, you know, the more the human learns how to quiet their mind, to bring their mind into stillness, this is where they begin to see what they are. And yes, it is inherent. It's an innate part of ourselves as these intelligent organisms. But also, um, we are kind of paving the way to a new human because this is not something that we've had an example to we don't we have never really quite had an example we have some examples maybe such as maybe a buddha or deities like these that have reached enlightenment the concept of enlightenment but i think that we're very we're a very nascent human race that really hasn't understood quite what that is there's still and and this is a result of religion that the concept of enlightenment or becoming this har harmonious organism is something that is very mystical. It's something that's very um, uh, unreachable at times. And, and in reality, it is our innate existence. So it's just a matter of the, of the human remembering that and cultivating, breaking away from these ideas of what they should be. And really, we're creating a new, a new way of existing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're like consciously evolving. It's mm -hmm. a new step or a new stage in evolution. There was like Darwinian evolution that brought us this far, that granted us this bodies, but now it's the next step and we take that into our own hands and evolve into who knows. Like you said, we don't really know. This is unseen territory. And it seems to be, to me, this is in the distant future, it seems to be we're evolving past these bodies. It seems like we're becoming light beings, 
if there is an inherent nature, our inherent nature is not tied to this physical vessel. So this is the future future I'm talking about. But I feel as though that is where this is all going. Like we're still going to have consciousness per se, but the consciousness is not going to be localized and sort of uh, stuck, you could say, to a body. It's more, be more, more freeing. It's hard to conceptualize. It's hard to put into words, but it seems like what we're doing is evolving out of the, the crude animal, the dense body into a more freer less dense sort of astral body or etheric body you could say and like i said that's the that's down the line but i think this that's where this is all going do you agree yeah you know actually i i would even say that we are those beings now and and here's why um we we have dna and in our dna only two percent of that dna is writing the protein that creates all of these complex systems in our human body okay the rest of that DNA is essentially, it's, it's an instruction manual. Um, it's a database of information. And the database of information is something that is interconnecting. It's the web of information that interconnects us with every single living organism on this planet and beyond. And that web is called the morphogenetic field. The morphogenetic field is the instruction manual. It's where this information is pulled from in order to create the form of this physical vessel. But within that morphogenetic field is actually the men, many, many fractals of your cell are interconnected to this physical vessel. So we are actually more non-physical than we are the actual physical body. And we have access to all that information in this now in this moment right now because what are dreams dreams are the fluctuations of brain waves which allows us to detach from the physical vessel in order to navigate higher dimensional realms and we do that every single night whether you remember that you have gone somewhere or you've had some dream or not whether you have organized your mind in a way where your dreams are clear or not you are still traveling in these in these dimensions. Yeah. And that is you navigating your morphogenetic field, the non-physical elements of yourself in which we have infinite fractals of ourselves that are existing simultaneously in this present moment. So for those of us that have contact experiences, for example, we are we are merging in other dimensions. And Again, time does not play a role here because time in, these, in, the, in this understanding of moving through these spaces, it doesn't exist in a linear manner. And so in our, in our dream state, we are, we are uh, accessing past lives, we're accessing future lives, we're accessing alien aspects, interdimensional. I don't like to use the word alien, I use interdimensional, but just to make sure we make that link, I'm talking about interdimensional aspects of ourselves. We literally are those beings and we interact and we have many simultaneous um, lives. We are making many contractual experiment, experiential agreements, many dimensions. And although that might seem um, overwhelming to some people, in reality, the reason why we have access to this information based on my research of working with hundreds of hypnosis clients and therapy and trauma discovery you know, ancestral patterns of, of traumas and memories, you know, we, we're kind of evolving through resonance and through our genetic lineages. Our family lineages are one of the most valuable sources of information for our ascension because they tell us where we're at in the bigger picture. How far are we from unity consciousness? And those uh, programs that we hold in our ancestral lineage are essentially the ones that are helping us refine our abilities in this dimension. And it creates a ripple effect in all of these other aspects of ourselves that we're coexisting with. Mm. Yeah, wow. Very well said. It seems like the evolution isn't really like a changing of anything other than our perception and our understanding of what we already are. Exactly, yes. It's a, yeah. it's a recovery of a memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remembering, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the evolution is really just a great remembrance. <laughs> Coming right. back home. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
oh, there's so much I want to dive into. Jeez, this is like this is touching upon so many different elements of spirituality. And it's like, where do we go from here? This is great. Um, wow. So let's just let's go dive down this uh, interdimensional beings. Yeah. What are these beings motive? What are the if you could summarize all of these people that have had contact and maybe even yourself? Do they have our best interests at heart? Are these beings like our guardian angels? Are there some not so good beings out there? Um, how would you describe how the contact has been with these beings and what is their motive? Yeah. So again, one of the things that I am hoping to dispel with my work and um, with my own experiences is that we are not a separate entity to these beings. And I know that that's a difficult concept to grasp because we see it as a, another, and it's a very odd other that we're not really even used to seeing. But, and I'll get to that. I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, there are two things that are important. Number one, we're not separate to them. And number two, time is not in the way that we think. So what does that mean? These experiences Although a lot of people have them and they uh, merge and bleed into the physical in this dimension. So people can even have like scars after their experiences. And like me, for example, it activated my psychic abilities like the next day, the exact day of, the, of this experience. And to me, that was my proof that I had this kind of experience. But what I realized is that actually I've been having those experiences all my life. I just didn't understand what was happening you know, since I was a child. And back then when I was a child, I didn't know anything about ETs or anything like that, interdimensionals. My idea was that these was a light being or an angel. That was the limitation of my perception and how I could explain it, you know. Uh, so, but when I understood later, I understood actually these are beings that we are interacting with and we put names on them. We have very, very limited filters of perception. Now, the more you wake up, and, and this is true for most experiencers, experiencers that are having and, and remember their contact, they have some level of awareness. They have some level of understanding. Oh, most of them are very psychic. They're extremely intuitive. They have gifts. They have abilities. These are people that have abilities that either were super uh, available to them as children, and then they have slowly closed down as they become adults. This is usually the case. And then at a later time when they have an awakening, then they recover some of these abilities. So that being said, um, we, we, we are making contractual experiential agreements with each other as humans. We have them with our family. We are born into these family lineages based on resonance as a soul. The moment that the soul is, is going through that inception process of linking into a physical cell, um, this is an entire universe that is taking a picture. And this universe is, is a, a frequency. That frequency is an exact match to this entire lineage. And the way that that match is made is a very complex uh, self-organizing intelligence that happens in many other lifetimes, even before that inception. So when you think of contact, and for example, experiences in the hybridization program where people have dreams of intercourse and sometimes end up with symptoms of pregnancy or are introduced to these alien children in their experiences, for example, that are a mix of themselves and some other genetics. We are talking about some kind of um, creation of organisms of consciousness that occurs interdimensionally. And so because we are interdimensional beings, procreation is not just linked to the way that we believe as survival. It's just survival. We, our idea of sex, our idea of procreation is extremely limited. We think that we have to create a child because we're going to pass on the legacy. But do we even understand what that means? Do we even know what it means to pass on a legacy? In reality, um, you know, and, and th these are things that ancient civilizations knew. And this is why this information has been extremely suppressed through history. 
is the concept of what it means to have a divine union um, in transmutational union with alchemy, transmutational sex, for example, in the creation of a soul. And so when this information was pushed out of, of the mainstream, the elites are the ones that took that information and they use that information in their sustaining of lineages. And we have family lineages that span all the way from the beginning, you know, to Tutankhamen, we, got, we have lineages that go all the way back to the origin. And the way that they have preserved their bloodlines are holding massive amounts of data. This is the legacy that we're talking about. This legacy is not just terrestrial, it's interdimensional. And we know that because we have, um, we have so much understanding that humans bred with gods. We have the Book of Enoch that talks about how the gods merged with the humans to create the human race. And the Emerald Tablets, I mean, I could go on and on. These concepts and stories about how the chimera or the combination of all of these uh, consciousness, these lineages, organisms come together to, to finally evolve into the human. And so we are cousins of these interdimensional beings. And that's, that's something our, our human race is essentially seeded. We are hybrids in a sense. We are a combination of these gods and, and beings, but not in the way that we think. Um, it just means that in our interdimensional DNA, we are cousins with these beings. So these experiences that people are having, contact experiences, are recollections of their interactions and because the human has many fractals to themselves, as I mentioned earlier, we exist in many dimensions simultaneously. We are waking up to the fractal of ourselves that is existing in another dimension, and we are leading lives as, I don't know, you can say a Pleiadian, an Arcturian, a, a reptilian, whatever it is. And the human begins to recover those memories, and it crosses a timeline. So the purpose, if, if you were to say, is something that it's a dual, it's, it's happening, we create it, and we are co-creating those experiences as well. Because we, we have many agreements for things in many dimensions that we don't, we don't even have consciousness of. And we've been participating in those agreements since we're children. And usually when the human goes through an awakening, then they begin to recover the memories. Then they begin to understand who they are and that they've been interacting with these beings for a long time. And it can be very terrifying uh, for people to uncover that information. But in reality, we are moving towards unity consciousness. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that we just don't come into wars here on the planet Earth. It means that you become a universal, multiversal organism of consciousness, of awareness, um, that, you know, you, you extend beyond this dimension. And there's a responsibility to that that we can talk about in just a minute. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful stuff. I think summarizing the spiritual path is that, though. There's many different ways to explain it, many different belief systems and lineages uh, explain it in their own way. But it's surrendering your sense of localized linear self to the whole right surrender to god essentially and that in a very simplistic manner i feel as though is how one can explain a true spiritual path is you give up your idea of just me it's just i'm just gary here doing my gary stuff and you realize there's a lot more going on than meets the eye yeah. <laughs> and according to you, definitely a lot more going on than meets the eye. <laughs> that's, um, that's powerful stuff, but I feel that. I feel that that is the truth. And, um, it's like, it's hard to conceptualize. It's hard to put into words. But when you put in the idea of it's nonlinear and it doesn't go by uh, our time scales, then it's easier to understand a little bit more, you know? And how they, it's all like intersecting timelines and you're, you're part of the intersection of the timelines. And, uh, 
yeah, it makes sense when you get out of our, when you get out of our like, um, just very shallow idea of time, I guess is yeah. the way to say it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and I mean, if we want to talk about purpose and agendas, the thing, the thing is this. So now that I explained that bigger, bigger picture, the thing, the thing is this, um, you talked to me about, you asked me, you know, what's the reason for these things? So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are many reasons. I mean, the kinds of activity that are happening, people, um, people have experiences of being on medical beds, you know, or, or slabs where a white light is coming and they're like, you know, this is the majority of the contact cases that people are, are, are talking about. There's uh, healings that are occurring, uh, amazing healings that are occurring, uh, spontaneous healings. I've experienced that myself. So we have experience of, of being in the presence of these beings surrounded by light, and then they do something to your body and they heal you. And that's, that has happened to me in many, many thousands of, of other contactees. There is hybridization, which is this concept of the creation of life. Um, there, and, and that does, in course, uh, include sexual intercourse scenarios and experiences. And some of these can be extremely dark and parasitic. And some of them can be very, very high vibrational and loving experiences. There are also training, trainings where people that have high developed senses are having these contact experiences. And oftentimes they are used for military purposes. Wow. Our military is um, very, um, there, there is an entire dark sector, uh, hidden sector of our military that interacts with these beings. Um, and I know that because um, I was taken into an underground base by these and I, I was utilized as a child to remote view certain military events as a child. Wow. And, um, you know, uh, when I, when I began to recover these memories, I, I realized, you know, how is it possible that I could have forgotten such a thing? But when you go into these support groups, you, you hear from thousands of people around the world, not just in America, around the world that are having these kinds of experiences. So, and the similarities in, in the kind of uh, the structure of the event, the way that things carry out is very similar. Um, so either we're going through some crazy psychosis, collective psychosis, or we have these incredible experiences uh, archetypal experiences, perhaps, you know, or we're, we're becoming aware of ourselves as being navigators, interdimensional navigators in our dream state. And we are living alternate lives in these dimensions. And we do interact with beings of other solar systems, you know, planetary systems that we are also a part of. Um, and other parts of the, of these contact experiences are supposedly for experimentation, but they're reported as some kind of experimentation. They feel that they're being experimented on. But what I've kind of developed over time, what I'm seeing by, by interviewing so many of these contactees that, you know, these are kind of mutual agreements. A lot of them are healings, they're activations, they are mutual family groups that, they, that these experiencers keep returning to, interacting with. A lot of my uh, contactees, um, describe that they get taken on board craft and they go into these capsules for healing and they become completely regenerated. They begin to recover. They get downloads of information, sometimes incredible information about their life or about their work, you know? So there's a major interaction going on. And my area of interest is the hybridization program because I feel that that is huge. Okay. The concept that we are being, we, we are participating in the creation of souls, essentially, because, you know, the soul is, is a portal to universes within that genetic code. Um, you know, our, our entire organism is, is a vortex system um, made of vortices or chakras, chakra bodies and all the other energy systems in the body. Um, they are gateways to universes and information of those universes, bloodlines and lineages. So we are so valuable we are extremely valuable as a human race. And so the intersection of these interdimensionals and where that information is crossing is the participation of a self-organizing intelligent universe that is creating. It creates life, it creates these experiences, it creates healing and evolution. And there are two sides to everything. There is an extremely parasitic element to these beings 
as much as there's an incredible unifying light. I will say that the beings that are really, really high vibration, they will never interfere with humans. Never. So that's something to really keep in mind because it has it speaks to our level of frequency because everything happens from resonance. Every single experience in your life is a result of your resonance. If your frequency is at one rate, it will absolutely manifest into the experiences, the people, the things, the places that you live are a match, period. And it is the same interdimensionally. So the more that the human refines themselves into this zero-point co-creator, the less they are interfering in unconscious states and manipulative states, in states of exchange, because a lot of these parasitic entities, they tend to be more manipulative, deceiving, those kinds of things, just like we are as humans when we're parasitic. They also behave in this way. So this process of evolution is, is discernment. The whole concept of contact, interdimensional contact, ET contact, is about your training and your mastery of discernment and to learn how to become a sovereign co-creator, essentially. Regardless what kind of experience it is, that, is, that seems to be the common um, theme to take away from these experiences. Mm -hmm. It's how to discern our actions here and how to actually be a conducive human being to our inherent unity? That's right. So, um, for example, I'll give you an example. In And this is a tough example. Um, I noticed that in military families, families that have a lot of heavy military in them, they seem to have a lot of experiences with Draco reptilian species. Okay? This is not a coincidence. A lot of times these are people mm. that grow up in the military. Their entire families have had experiences like this, dreams since they were children with Draco Reptilian, you know, and and sometimes there's a lot of abuse. Um, you know, the shadow side of our world is about the inversion of nature. It focuses on the inversion of nature, which is manipulation. Anytime we lie, anytime we try to manipulate, we are doing the opposite of what is the natural course of co-creation. So that's how you know when someone is in a parasitic state of creation. So these humans that are in this mindset of power control, um, you know, they are, they are feeding these entities and they are interacting with them because our actions, when we're connected to parasites, because we have parasites through, because, because our DNA is a vortex, um, we hold within our body resonant information based on the main programs that we're holding. So for example, if we have severe fear and trauma in our lineage, and usually it's combined with sexual trauma, sexual trauma actually fractalizes the soul in such a powerful way. That's the most powerful way to break the human into oh. fractals, is sexual abuse. So this is why a lot of these occult groups that practice, um, you know, really manipulation. I mean, you have Hollywood, you have a lot of these little dark things that you hear in our planet Earth. They all understand that the way to break the human soul is through this kind of abuse. And so these children will be raised in these families of abuse. And most of their experiences are with these kinds of beings. And they also fall into parasitic experiences in their dream state. So these, again, there are agreements that are made interdimensionally in many lives that these families are cycling through. So to clean that up, the human would have to reintegrate themselves from that sexual trauma. They would have to break the patterns that keep being repeated of trauma in these lineages that are very karmic per se, you know, um, in order to shift the frequency. And what I've noticed is that when my clients that have healed and, and separated themselves from those things and they begin to refine that in their, in their system, um, their experiences completely change. They begin to activate, you know, higher sense of interconnectedness, uh, higher sense of truth and harmony with themselves and everything. And that's extremely important because now the human can manifest health, vitality, 
you know, intuitive navigation of everyday experiences and also interdimensional. So they become very lucid in their dreams and they can take back their power. Mm. Because in the same way that we make choices every day, like somebody can come and say, I'll give you a million dollars if you do something bad, if you take something from a store. Um, We are also have propositions like that in these dream states. Uh. And we don't often understand what are the consequences of that because we're, we're very, we're very unconscious. The more conscious that we become, the more we understand the bigger picture of the impact of our choices. So, um, you know, there, there's a major responsibility to that. And so that, that's some of the things that might be happening in these, in these scenarios of contact. Wow. Yeah. It's funny. We have the saying, it was just a dream. Ah, yeah. It was just a dream. Really, was it? Yeah. Was yeah. it just a dream? Exactly. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Yeah, it's funny how, well, I don't know if it's funny, but it's um, it's true how we put just such a little weight into our dream world, mm-hmm. our dream life, but it's literally a third of our experience here in these bodies. And yeah. we're just, oh, it's just a dream, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a dream too, you can say, because uh-huh. this is a holographic system as well. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Exactly. I think that's part of awakening is realizing there is no dream world. There is no waking world. It is all one world and one experience. Yeah. It's all that's this right. one cohesive experience. That's right. Mm-hmm. Wow. Also, what I'm getting from this is how important it is to have healthy sexual relations. Absolutely. You know, wow. our world is quite the opposite, you could say, in a in a nice manner. It's quite the opposite to that. We have very unhealthy sexual habits. And how many of us are born on accident? You know, a lot. A lot of us aren't out of a, uh, we're not born out of a conscious union. Well. Go ahead. Kind of, kind of, kind of. Okay. This is the thing. Please. There is no soul that is born without major purpose, Uh not one single. And here's why, because you are part of an intelligent organism of self-organization. This is how incredible it is. So, and and this goes really deep because what you're saying is so powerful right now. Okay. Um, Even if it's a one night stand, let's say, these people were united. They met at the bar and it's not random. Yeah. And this is something that I understood from the hybridization program after reviewing hundreds of hybridization experiences and listening to these repetitive uh, scenarios there that, that are orchestrated for humans to unite. Now, the resonance that, the, that brought these two together can be karmic, unfortunately. And the child that is born from there has a purpose to clean up these two lineages, and those are agreements that were made. So every single soul that is born here is extremely powerful and important. I will say that. Yeah, I like that. Even if it's an accident, there's no accidents. <laughs> we're yes, all supposed to be. Exactly. Here. That's mm-hmm. right. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Although there's got to be more power. This is just me off the top of my head. There's got to yeah. be more power in two parents that have love for each other and they have a conditional i mean sorry unconditional love and they say all right let's create a person and they create a person there's got to be just something i don't know if it's better or worse per se but it's just got to be a lot different in terms of the karma that that being reaps in that life you know it's just like being born of of loving parents rather than just a one night stand it has to be just completely different different reasons different purposes and i'm not going to even try to explain how or why but it's got to be just a completely different contract you could say in in the soul yeah absolutely well let's talk about that for a minute because um sexual alchemy is something that has been studied by taoist schools um and even even ancient Christian schools, um, you know, a lot of the ancient mystery schools talked about sexual energy and how to cultivate that, the proper way of utilizing sexual energy. Why? Because our sexual energy is the most powerful creative life force that exists. Mm -hmm. You can create an entire human 
<laughs> with this. I mean, that's yeah. insane. And so it's a universe that multiverses that are being created by these two humans. And so um, what happens is our, our bodies function like vortices. Okay. And we have, you know, two bigger vortices that are made out of all the micro vortices in our body. We have seven main chakras. These seven chakras are self-organizing all the at infinite potential that we are, that connection to source, which is like a white light, you know, white light contains all the colors of the rainbow. But when it goes through that refraction mechanism of where the non-physical meets the physical in the crown, in the seventh and the eighth chakra, it organizes within the chakra system from the lowest frequency of the root to the highest frequency. And these represent the different densities of matter from which we can interact with. So what happens is that the human, the human that has most of these root sacral solar, heavily stagnant with traumas, with blockages, with sexual trauma, for example, you know, emotional pains, um, that vibrational resonance creates a limit to how much conductivity this bioelectrical organism can produce in the body. Now, what creates is bioelectricity. Okay, that that is the charge that creates life. Literally, when when an egg is inseminated, there's a flash of light that occurs, and that flash of light, the potency of that flash of light is actually a product of the charge of these two humans. Wow. So what happens when there is a parasitic relationship, for example? Okay. Unfortunately, the resonance of these two humans are coming from a lower frequency, lower emotions. And when there's that union, um, it is a weak charge. It becomes a weaker charge. Now, how does that look genetically? What happens is in the DNA, it has inherited all of this trauma, a very dense, slow-moving frequency. Now, what happens with these bloodlines is that the soul that is called forth to incarnate is an exact match vibrational frequency to heal the entire lineage of both parents, not just one or the other, both of them. So even though the charge of the information that's going into the soul the soul that becomes attached is like five times more elevated than the density of that uh, pain and suffering. And this is why a lot of really conscious awake children are born into very, very, very traumatic bloodlines. In fact, there's a study that is talking about how in a lot of these traumatic lineages, people are highly intuitive. And in a way, because we live in a, in a socially engineered world, you really need to understand what it means that we live in a socially engineered world. It means that there's a certain percentage of individuals that know how the human functions from the inside out, and they engineer things in a way to control things in a, in a certain outcome. And that's really huge. Because when a humanity, again, is maintained in the illusion of survival, that that is the only way to exist is to be in survival. We are manipulated through sex, we are manipulated through our emotions, and we are manipulated through our, our belief that we are disempowered and have no mastery over this physical realm. So when you embed that into society, um, in a, in a, in a human race that is highly intuitive, highly powerful, highly activated, has the potential of high activation because every single human has intuitive abilities. Every single human can remote view. Every single human can move things, can direct and change things like Jedi's, like Star Wars, for example. It's a beautiful example of abilities that humanity does have the ability to achieve. And so We've seen this in sages and in, in, in many, many amazing lights that have visited Earth, even Jesus Christ. So those are the examples of, that, of those Christic bloodlines that are created by the alchemical process of transmuting lower form frequency into higher form frequency. In the body, when we clean up the chakras, we can move energy. And when we alchemize that into the pineal gland, 
there's a chrism that is created, the oil, this important frequency information that creates DMT, which opens up your vision into higher dimensions, your clarity, your understanding of who you are. And this magnif ma uh, magnifies your magnetic field. It makes your heart chakra because it's the heart that is the key to the integration of the physical and the non-physical. So when there's a union from two individuals that are practicing this conduit creation of the heart, the soul that is brought in is going to be a soul that is extremely intuitive and that follows along these paths of the sages, for example. And we've seen that in history. It's something that has been preserved and practiced by many old schools, but they have been messed up, that they have been manipulated. This information has been turned into a tantra or, you know, there are some tantric schools that teach these things, but they talk about pleasure and they talk about, you know, techniques and positions. And it's absolutely not about that at all. It is all about the cultivation of life force for pure creation, which means clear intention, not unconscious, not confused, not, not sure. That, that's the sign of, of nature. Nature has everything with precise um, purpose, you know, and that's actually where you understand if you're creating from a pure place. Mm. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, this is quite powerful. Um, you are a very learned person. You definitely know your stuff. I can tell you have a firm understanding in, in all of this. This is great. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, this seriously, I mean that. And um damn, I don't even know where to go. Who All right, so who are these bad bloodlines? Like do we even know who these people are or do they just work from the shadows? You know what I mean? Do we do we have any names for these people or, or are they just uh literally in the shadows and we have no clue? Yeah, so um we we well, some of us do know who they are. It's actually not that hard um, to know who they are. All we have to do is follow the banking system <laughs> and follow the trail of where the money is, okay? That's unfortunately yeah. the truth. Um, who is in control of our, of our world organized system? Who is behind these new world order agendas? Who is behind these financial systems? Um, that's where you will find the names of the bloodlines that have existed for millennia with very specific agendas. And they are the reason from which the Tavistock Institute were created, which is where your entire marketing and industrialization of the mind and the human manipulation of consciousness began. And all of that was very carefully orchestrated after World War II, um, where there very much is a type of eugenics, a global eugenics program in which the understanding of yourself as an organism of DNA is so complex. And when I say social engineering, I'm not just talking about, you know, you get to be a consumer. I'm talking about your lineages are being put into certain social systems, certain financial, monetary systems, educational systems, and there is a self-organizing system in this world, actually, that organizes genetic bloodlines. Now, why would I say such a thing? You know, um, after researching so many different contactees from around the world, beginning to look at the patterns of the bloodlines and the information that they hold, the blood types, um, the patterns of trauma that runs through these lineages, and how some of these lineages are more psychic than other. It seems that most contactees that hold this RH negative bloodline are highly intuitive. They have, they have this in common. This was done in the paper roll uh, project that, and I have this information on my, on my website that you can check out, but it was, it was researched, you know, thousands of contactees. And, you know, I did my own research aside from that. And I've also studied other countries that have done similar research on contactees. And it seems to be a certain common factor um, 
that bloodlines that hold high vibration, high intuitive history are kind of narrowed into very specific social groups. Okay. And so it goes, it goes even deeper to that because um, our genetic information, when, when it becomes weakened by fake food, plastic food, food that isn't nourishing, um, water that is toxic, uh, you know, societal stress and complete survival um, environment, it completely deteriorates the information that is being passed down every generation. So it really is an interesting time that we're in where we're becoming aware of these kinds of things and waking up consciousness and understanding that your sovereignty has to do with every part of your life, what you're eating, um, how you are able to um, exist in harmony with yourself. You have food, you have emotional state, uh, regulated nervous system. Um, you are conscious and practicing your intuition and you are able to sustain a harmonious family nucleus that is not being socially programmed by the societal systems. And I think it's important to understand that. And now we have the element of technology and we're coming into an era of artificial intelligence and that is going to catapult a lot of disinformation out in the open. So we have to be prepared for paradigm destructions, destructions of our old paradigms. What we thought was our history, what we thought was our sciences, a lot of that is gonna change drastically in the next few years. And so humanity essentially is going through a major re reawakening where all these fantasies and illusions that once, you know, governed this, this world was dominated by are now going to fall. And so the human will need to come back to themselves and to understand that the sovereignty and the mastery of this physical body in the present moment, regardless of what's happening outside, is the key to elevating and pushing forward this society out of these parasitic unconscious systems that have been ruling for a long time. We are entering um, next year into the period nine and period nine is the rebirth. It's the beginning. Right now, this is an eight year. Eight represents karmic cycles. It's infinity. There's a lot of karmic things that are coming to an end right now. Things that are coming to the surface. Period nine will be the beginning of a new frequency for humanity. A uh, higher octave frequency. And so we're talking about ETs, we're talking about contactee. Why? Because we're becoming multidimensional citizens. And our DNA is the blueprint of from which all these experiences emerge. So the more that we refine suffering, pain, this illusion of separation from our organism, mind, body, and soul, the more prepared we will be for the kind of shifts that are coming now. Okay. So, yeah. And, and so, again, the human is never a victim. We are victims of our own ignorance. We're the victims of our own fear. And it just requires us to come back to the self because all this information that I'm telling you, I uncovered through my own meditation. I sat in meditation for three months, um, nine hours a day, and I began to clean myself. And that's when this world opened up to me. I didn't know it existed before that moment. So it's available to everyone. If I can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> I can assure you of that. Yep. Amen. Amen. We are all the sage. We are all the shaman. I think that's where this is all going. This is all leading us to the personal sainthood in a way. And that leads to ultimately, like you said, sovereignty. So once... We as a species, as the human species, establishes this innate sovereignty within. How does this look on a collective scale? Like, how does our world change in the physical realm? Would we be able to explain how this new earth, this new world that we're building looks like? You know, is there any, like... Um, because personally, I, I think it'll look like an alien world. I don't think it'll be something that we, is really reminiscent of the world that we have now. There may be some, obviously, characteristics, things such as our technology that we still use. But in terms of like how we treat each other, the media, uh, just a lot of the physical manifestations of the world, 
it's going to completely change. What is going to be different, would you say, about this new earth, this new world? Um, how would you even describe where this is all going? Yeah, that's uh, such a profound question. Um, you know, something that's really beautiful, um, when I had my contact experience and I, I was taken to the Pleiades, in my experience in, in 2013, and I was shown these civilizations that were just so beautiful. It was the integration of conscious technology um, that was basically organic technology. And when we think of that, we think of sci-fi films and we think of these dystopian future type situations. But what these beings have, are showing us and it, through these contact experiences are also other worlds and how those worlds are structured. And it's something that a lot of contactees become aware of when they recall their experiences. And I think it's, it's one of the most important information that is passed down by these experiences. Um, uh, contactees are learning about new technologies. They're learning about nature, how to exist in harmony with nature, and the merging, the conscious merging of technology and nature, which is where we are headed. We are essentially learning how to and this is, we're going to go through the speed bump right now with artificial intelligence right now. We're just in the beginning of that little speed bump. It's going to be tough. People are going to be afraid of the technology. But we have to wake up consciousness in such a way that we become proactive in our world of actively moving into a conscious merging where we go out of the old world mentalities of control and power and a very small percentage controlling this world in this way in order to profit in this survivalistic idea and model of, of life um, into one that is always looking for the healing, the unification and the betterment of the whole organism. So we stop looking at ourselves as individuals. Remember how that was so pushed in, in societal engineering. The idea that you have to be independent, you have to be away. Now we are going on the opposite direction. We have to come back to the unity nucleus of the family. We have to come back to the unity of community. We have to come back to the unity in our, in our groups of thought, of mind, politically, um, financially. Now it's not just about personal gain and survival, but it's about sharing, cooperating, caring for other humans, not just seeing a homeless person driving on and not making it our problem. There are, there's, and, and in these advanced societies that we are being introduced through all these contactees around the world, they have all been introduced in some way to these advanced civilizations. And we are remembering how we have existed or we do exist really in other dimensions um, with this unification of technology, science, and nature. And that's kind of where we're headed. It, it, it's, you know, in our society, it's kind of been compartmentalized, all these things as separate. And the future holds the integration because that is actually how we're going to learn how to live in harmony. Right now, that compartmentalization allows us to monetize and to make money off these separate systems. And we have, for example, we had so many amazing inventions that came into our, our realms that were, you know, taken off because they, they would mess up major financial corporations that don't want to have that pro progress, whether it's electricity, whether it's oil, you know, so, so this is, so this is a, a, a shift in, in control, power and intention that is going to be changing in our future. Yeah. And it's about harmony. How do we come into harmony? Yeah. And, and you, you asked me, you know, how does that look like? Well, right now the world is a reflection of our internal turmoil. And how do I know this? Because of the nature of this organism, this holographic system, the spiral architecture of this organism, that means that we are abiding by the Fibonacci sequence, which is one of the most important equations to understand because it's found in all of nature. It is the foundational structure of all organisms in this universe. And what that means that um, 
we, we, are, we have to learn how to um, break away from the idea that we are separate from this organism in a way that whatever is happening to each human individual internally, their pain, their suffering, it's reflected like a fractal. You are a fractal of this planet Earth as a whole, of the entire human race. So the more that we clean up the suffering, the traumas in ourselves, in our family lineages, we begin to clean up this collective suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we will start to see major changes in, in the human race. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting that you phrase it like that. The as above, so below yeah. framework. Because I think you described before, when we operate from the ego, it's sort of parasitic. And you yeah. can look at the human collective as being parasitic to the earth right now. Exactly. We're sucking the earth dry of energy with our current state of technology. But you're saying the way forward is actually more toward a harmonious relationship with the earth within ourself firstly but then also that reflects upon the technology we yield from the earth yeah and how we use technology mm -hmm. because right now there's a lot of um well it's all it's all new it's all new but the world will change very quickly in the next five years with the technology that is emerging yeah well the thing is that we don't want that technology to get into the wrong hands and to be constantly in the state of these parasitic systems that's why we have to step up in what we do all areas of life, every career that you're in uh, as a human, whatever career you have, how can you contribute to the healing of these systems in what you're doing? That's going to be something to become aware of and to start implementing if you want to see change. Mm, yeah. When you say organic technology, do you mean technology that isn't really like physical, something that is just inherent, more of like a psychic technology that we would yield well that is one kind of technology right and and of course we play a major role in that because you know our intuitive our body is actually one of the most advanced technologies in this universe um and that's something that we have to learn how to master and the funny thing is that for example google learning systems has been collecting data from every single human on this planet to create a massive learning computing system it's basically a brain. It's an organism mm. that has learned from every human on this planet. Can you imagine the power of that? The calculation power, the programming power in that system? So in that same way, the problem is that humans haven't learned themselves. So a lot of these systems and these organizations, they understand the way that the human works more than we understand ourselves. And that's where we're at a disadvantage. And that's where we can easily come into manipulation and participation of parasitic systems, where our dollar goes, you know, and, and this can be everything in parasitic systems of clothing, food, you know, education, whatever it is. So to change that, the human, like, we, we really need to um, understand how our human body works because the way that our bodies are structured within the seventh and eighth chakra of our body, we begin to connect with the DNA of the earth. And this is also called by some as the Akashic records, the Akashic record, which is the memory database of all living organisms, yourself, your past lives, your future lives, and then those of all your other brothers and sisters. And the reason why it's important to tune into that is because you can tune into the history of this planet. You can understand, um, and see beyond the illusion and the veils that were created by our educational system and by these controlling systems. So when you can see beyond that by looking at the real history of the planet, the real history of yourself as we've evolved, you begin to understand why things are the way they are. And it's important that we understand that. It's important that we understand how we got to where we are here today. And um, you know, we, we need to understand our participation how much has our family participated in, this, in, in creating these parasitic systems? In my healing journey, I found going back to South America, to Bolivia, to Italy, to Spain, beginning to look at these parasitic systems in my bloodline. And you see traces of those programs in the way that we speak, in the way that we dress, in the way that we talk to people and think about each other. You see? So this is how we inherit these systems and we play them out in our everyday lives. So this is how you deprogram that. 
And the human that understands that begins to understand how these learning systems of artificial intelligence are collecting information. So we want to, when, when I say organic technology, eventually technology will be a product of these learned systems. And we already see that in AI. I follow very closely artificial intelligence conferences because everything that we've taught this system is being utilized to create um, companies and products that are going to be implemented in our society. Okay, and that's really huge. Because mm -hmm. again, this is a socially engineered version of humanity. So we have to be careful with that. It's not the true version of humanity. The true version of humanity is one that has empathy. It's one that is conscious, that is co-creative and intuitive and connected to themselves. And so we think with technology, we've become so desensitized to suffering. We become desensitized to our own pain because we are constantly escaping in social media, the cell phones, you know, the TVs, the movies, the films, the music even. We cannot sit still with our own organism. And this is, this is how to weaponize the human against their sovereignty, really. Okay. So um, conscious technology is what these very highly developed civilizations, um, they have learned how to use this learning system, this brain system that Google and all these other companies have now created, have been creating for years. They learn how to use that in becoming an information network of harmony. And that's what we need to do. We need to use that incredible computational power to begin to resolve the major problems in our world, not for profit, but for the betterment of humanity so that we can move away from survival. The problem with that model is that that doesn't make money in the way that it's not, it's not a consumer capitalistic system anymore. And so that's going to be um, a bump that we're going to have to mature through. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Utilizing AI in a way that is not destructive, for sure. Yeah, because the computational power, AI is a good example of what it's like to have an ET contact. Okay. Because yep. it's the computational power of artificial intelligence is very similar. To when you are in the presence of, a, of an interdimensional being, you are so humble to the advanced intelligence that these beings have, the intuitiveness, the knowing, the understanding. They see you inside out in one second. And this is how yeah. these technologies are functioning now. Mm -hmm. Hyperintelligence. I was yeah. actually listening to Terrence McKenna. You know Terrence McKenna, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was listening to a talk of his from the 90s. And he was saying all of this in the 90s, that mm -hmm. what we're doing is building technology to come into contact with another being. He said the alien isn't extraterrestrial per se. The alien is something that we uncover through our technology. Mm -hmm. And that's almost that's using a, us to build that's itself. That's right. That's a very good way to put it. And, and I can tell you that's very accurate to how things actually are. That's yeah. for sure. You just yeah. listen to some contactees and their experiences, and that's going to prove for you that, that comment. <laughs> really? So people have said that the aliens, quote unquote, are using this technology to come in contact with us? Yeah, well, it's kind of like reverse engineering. So, yeah. so the thing is, we look at our ancient civilizations, and we look at the way that it was built, we have no idea the kind of technology that used to exist on this planet. We're going through cycles. So this technology is new to us, but it's not new to this earth. We've had, we've had many ver versions of this kind of technology on this planet before. The question is this time around, are we gonna destroy ourselves or are we gonna come into harmony? That's the question. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. It's almost like with Atlantis and Lemuria, we got to that point, we almost made it. But with great yeah. power comes great responsibility and we self-destruct right. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And the other thing is we're also going to be uncovering new civilizations in the next five years. A lot of new civilizations are going to be uncovered. That's a hot topic right now. Yes. Is it really? I haven't, I haven't paid attention, but... Well, do you know people like Graham Hancock? 
Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, people like Graham Hancock would be like, what? That's craziness. But now it's on Netflix. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So that's a huge turn for us. So we got to learn from what we uncover from these ancient civilizations because it will help us piece Mm. together this puzzle piece of new humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The times we're in. (laughs) <laughs> so interesting, huh? So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you could say, well, you know, we exist simultaneously in other dimensions, but uh for the sake of this conversation, <laughs> the times that we are in right now in the year of quote 2024. Oh man. I can't imagine being born in another time in the past like literally in the dark ages Europe. I pictured like a lifestyle like that. It just so dense so shallow (laughs) compare it to now it's like we're almost quite literally a different being a different species but we're not we're still the same biological humans with the same dna but it seems quite different may you be born in interesting times is the old saying and these are the interesting of the interesting times that we are in it is the unveiling of all of this knowledge it's coming at us from all directions whether you want to say AI, interdimensional aliens, uncovering past civilizations, uncovering all of this within ourself. It's just, it's coming in so fast, you know? And I love it. <laughs> I love it personally. I think it's awesome. But I think a lot of people are going to be um, caught off guard by how fast all of this is coming in you know but i think for good reason i think ultimately it's going to gonna uh tilt us to truth in one way or the other you know it's gonna yeah. like uh, it might upset a lot of people but that upset energy will eventually lead us down the road of acceptance you know that's right yeah i think it's really important for us to train the zero point because um we have to understand that we are all and nothing simultaneously, and we are not these physical bodies. We are infinite beings of light, of energy, this, this charge. And when you see yourself as that, the concept of death, this finite way of looking at things and seeing and feeling things begins to shift. That's very important for us to become friends with the unknown. Because we're going to go through many major unknown moments, meeting unknown type of situations, and a lot of people are going to lose it. And it's very important to not attach to your belief systems. Don't attach to your identity. Try to move into a more um, um, a more um, I don't want to say the word fluid, but just understand that you are not any one thing. And in the spiritual community, it can be easy to also get stuck on concepts and we get very identified with our spiritual practices and and everything. So we have to understand spiritual work is absolutely 100% internal. We don't need to depend on anyone outside of us. We don't need to depend on any technology, anything outside. And that is really where the human comes into this freedom, the true freedom the true sovereignty, the true harmony with themselves and all things. It's about going in, really, really going in and seeing the world from the observer Mm. that will be important at this time of major changes. Amen. Yeah. From the subject, seeing oneself from the subject rather than having the subject object orientation, seeing it all as the witness. Right. Exactly. You got it. Yeah. And I feel as though when one does function from this subject orientation, one may think it leads to a sense of passiveness in their life. Oh, I'm just going to sit back and chill, just meditate. Yeah. No, it's actually quite the contrary. It actually leads to more action in one's life, just effortless, natural action to take part in this play and to create alongside the grand creation that one can witness. It's quite beautiful. That's right. And I will say, actually, the zero point is actually the point of pure creation. And it's actually the point in which you are most able to apply free will. Really, any time before that, you actually very little have very little access to free will. 
because we are such a deeply interconnected organism with many other systems universally. Um, and we are interdependent human race. So our free will lies in this bioelectrical cultivation of this organism, because the bioelectrical charges that you put through your emotions, your intentions, and the rate of your vortex is spinning in a centripetal manner where you become a magnetic system of creation. That is the only way to become a creator. Um, the opposite of that is to be counter-creating. Your energy is depleting. You're not connected to yourself. You're externalizing your power. There's no magnetism in this organism for creation. So all you will do is fall into the cyclical cycle of repetition program. That's it. And that repetitive pattern is reading from your DNA. So whatever your ancestors have been struggling with for generations, you're going to go right back into that cycle of suffering. And you have no free will, you have no power, no ability to choose um, or create. You are creators. So we have to learn how to become creators. And it's all in architecture. There's a mechanism behind that. It's in your emotions and it's in your cultivation of your bioelectrical nervous system. So. Amen. Amen. I feel it. <laughs> I feel the power. I think this is a good note to wrap it up at, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Yeah. This was a wonderful talk. You are a wonderful person. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing your time, effort, and wisdom with me and anybody that decides to listen in the future. So, yeah, Geraldine, keep doing your thing. Keep doing your thing. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, Gary, so much for having me. It's been an honor. Of course. Thank you. The honor is mine to have you. Uh, I feel like we just touched the tip of the iceberg. But it was enough. It was enough for me. Um, keep you just know you know so much. Like you just like you just got it. I you're the real deal. You're the real deal. So keep doing your thing, <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Um, peace and love to you, and peace and love to anybody that listened this long. Goodbye. Peace.